and I'd like to welcome all of you to BMES and BQ's EEG analysis workshop. Today with us, we have Yunus Sedat Nijad, who's doing his PhD at U of T. Um, all of you are encouraged to follow along on MATLAB, and yesterday on your emails, you should have received two links to download, um, two toolboxes, the first being the EEG analysis and the second brainstorm. So if you haven't done that, please do so now. Um, please don't use your microphones to ask questions. We do have a Q&A chat box that you can type your questions into. And you can also vote on other people's questions if you have the same issues. And without further ado, I'll hand it to Eunice. Okay, uh, thank you everyone for joining. Um, my name is Eunice Alanjad. Currently, I'm a PhD student at the University of Toronto Autism Research Center at uh, Holland Blue View Hospital. But uh, I did my bachelor and master at Ryerson University. And first of all, I wanted to thank everyone who attended and then secondly uh, uh, individuals who is who are helping us to keep this workshop running. Um, so this specific workshop the focus is on EEG um, analysis and as you um, probably know and which is the reason you're here similar to me you find a brain very fascinating and um, the brain is a multi-scale complex network which means um, at the different scales, we are able to analyze data from the brain. At very local scale, um, at the instantaneous moments, we can look at the activity of the brain, but this moment uh, with respect to time, which we call the temporal information, could vary. Instead of looking at every second of time, we could look at um, the life, uh, the behavior of the brain in an individual in a lifespan. This could farther scale up looking at the evolutionary. So people by people or homo sapiens in general, how the brain has changed. This is in terms of a temporal, which is dependent on the time. In terms of a spatial location, we can take a look at the, at the cellular level to see how neurons activities are within a brain. We could farther look at the population of the neurons, uh, which is going to be what we were looking at and we could look at also a specific regions or interregional connectivity of the brain. And these are um, things that define the spatial information, which is information with respect to location. Similarly, uh, we could look at more complex aspects of the brain, such as the topology of the brain, which describes the connectivity of different part of the brain. This connectivity at, again, lower level could be just a local between different nodes or neurons of the brain, but it could also farther scale to a global view of the brain or even looking at the differences in the brain uh, within different individuals. Specifically, the focus of my research during the master, as well as this workshop, is on a, a EEG, which stands for electroencephalography. EEG measures the change in the neural activity of the brain with respect to time. And um, so at brain, we have different millions and millions number of neurons. And these neurons are uh, cause and spark activity or cause a small electric potential. Uh, what we are doing essentially at EEG is that we are aiming to capture this spark um, activity or brain electrical activity on the surface of the head. And this is what defines scalp EEG. So we have also intracranial EEG, which is looked at the electrical activity inside of the brain, but the focus of this work is on a scalp EEG. A couple of reasons, most importantly, it is a non-invasive way of measuring their brain. So it's not going to harm the individuals. Secondly, it's very cost effective. We essentially what we require is a good EEG instruments that could capture the activities. And lastly, as you're hearing more and more similar to, for example, Neuralink, it has a very promising future. If we can understand how brain behaves, we can solve many problems and we can tackle many, many challenges. So the focus on today's workshop is on processing the data that are observed from EEG, which are the 
electrical activities of the brain. This process and uh, doing this analysis and process could have multiple reasons. We, maybe we are focusing in order to study brain or specific regions of the brain. Maybe we want to have better understanding about the memory, about uh, functions that happen inside the brain, the behavior, the emotions, language. Or maybe we are doing this for a diagnosis of neurological disorders, such as epilepsy, Parkinson, Alzheimer, neurodevelopmental or neurodegenerative disorders as well. Or maybe we are looking to develop um, uh, assistive devices, such as brain-computer interface, which is essentially requires first to listen and understand what or how uh, the brain's activity, but then also convert those activities in, in a form of um, uh, actions. So the task that the device should take based on the brain's uh, interaction. So the, all of these could be a reasons, or and even more the reasons that you may want to analyze and study the EEG from the brain. The focus of today's um, workshop is that I want to provide very overall inter, um, uh, uh, overview of what are the steps that should be taken in analyzing an EEG for any of these tasks. So what I will refer to or what I will talk more about is uh, essentially the, the, the view that you should have when if you're just getting started on working on EEG or if you have already worked on it, the view that you most likely are familiar with. Um, so throughout this workshop, I will only have one equation that I will talk about. So uh, I found hopefully it's not going to be boring and what I will introduce and provide is going to be more hands-on experience, things that you could right away take action to and start doing the analysis of the brain at the earliest stage. So let's first talk about what is really EEG and what is a scalp EEG in specific. So consider this brain and consider that um, at every second of your life, even if you're asleep, there are brain activities happening inside of your brain. So there are uh, chemical behaviors within the neurons and these chemical behaviors are causing uh, electric potential and these electric potential are causing uh, your brain to, to perform a function. Uh, what we're doing at the level of scalp EEG is that obviously between the brain and the skin on your head, there are multiple layers, including the brain tissue, uh, as well as most importantly, the skull of the brain. So if after passing through the skull and getting to the skin, this is where the scalp EEG happens. So it's completely non-invasive. What we are doing essentially is that we are setting a number of sensors on top of the head and we are trying to really listen to the electrical activities that happen inside of the brain. So these sensors, by most, most of the times, by using wires and um, uh, uh, sensor electrodes, are then observed and digitalized by sampling rate and by digitalization inside of the computer and you will then be able to see what these electrical activities are. So what you see in here is a sample of an EEG data uh, from different channels. So this specific sample, first specific sample is coming from the first sensor, second channel from the sensor, second sensor and so on. And these are uh, voltages or amplitudes uh, of the representation of the brain activity after passing through all of these different tissues and being captured by the sensor. This is a real EEG data that you're seeing here. It's actually my own brain uh, data that I was experimenting with um, during my master. But as you can see, the data itself does not really uh, re reveal anything. So by just looking at this information, if you haven't done any sort of a processing or if you don't know what the task is, why this data has been taken, they don't quite uh, provide any valuable information about brain. So the goal of EEG signal processing or EEG analysis is to take this certain data and perform set of algorithms, set of tasks that, that allows us to have 
some understanding about what is happening inside of the brain, depending on the application that we are tackling. Uh, there is a general pipeline when we are doing any sort of EEG analysis. The first step is to obviously collect the data and then is to perform pre-processing on this data. The second step is that after this data is being uh, available and after we make it in a way that is ready to be analyzed, we use data analysis methods that I will cover some in order to, um, to analyze the data. And last step is to discuss the results and try to have a clinical interpretation. So you will, based on an analysis, get some sort of result. And the last step of your work will be um, to, to use this data in order to be able to analyze it and be able to show how clinically relevant this information is. This could be a workup and biomedical engineer, but it could also be a workup and neuroscientist or psychologist, and all of these goes back to the objective of the research you're doing. For today's workshop, because the goal is to introduce you to the general pipeline, we will focus on the pre-processing and data analysis parts. So obviously I will provide some examples, but we're not gonna go into the actual interpretation or clinical relevancy of what I am showing. It's mostly what will we get as a result. And we are again assuming that data has already been collected from EEG data because that part is a more clinician part or the clinical part. Um, so the first thing that we have to talk about, and this is the first step of pre-processing, is to um, define where these electrodes are positioned. So knowing where these electrodes are really provides a valuable information from this stuff. And the reason is that, let's say if there's a specific electrode is on front, in front of the brain, if we know this is in front of the brain and it's not on the back, then right away we have uh, additional embedded information inside of the data that we want to analyze. So obviously then the, the first step is that we got to make sure the clinician or who took a data could pass on this information about the placement of the electrode to the individual who, who's doing the processing. In this case, that will be us. So this is the first thing we have to define. Now in EEG analysis, this is known as electroplacement standard, and it really depends on two factors. The first factor is the number of the electrodes or sensors you're putting on the brain. This could be as small as six to, let's say, nine uh, in the new variable devices, but usually more than about 1960 or at most 1,024 electrodes. Um, and depending on the number of the electrodes we are using, then the, their placement will be different because the goal is that we want to be able to cover the brain as much as possible so we can gather information about different parts of the brain. If we have lower number of electrodes, let's say 19, we have to distribute the sensors more widely with respect to each other so we can cover the whole brain. Well, if we have 1,026, they have to sit beside each other very tightly in order to, so we can fit in all the electrodes. And because of that, there has been systems developed in order to help us to understand how the electrodes has been set. You will see them uh, as if you search for them or if once you start working on EEG as 10, 20 systems, for example, or 5, 20, or 5, 10 systems or 20, 20 systems and so on. So there will be two numbers and there will be a called system. So what this is, is that uh, the distances between the adjacent electrodes uh, are either, when we say, let's say 10, 20 system, it means that the distance between two electrodes are either 10% or 20% of the total front, back, uh, left, and right distances of the whole skull. So this information is valuable because when a clinician 
which could be you or someone else, takes the data and it's 60 channels, they still have to say how they have sorted these channels or located them on, on the brain. And in order to uh, have these channels uh, for the analysis person who's analyzing it to understand how these placements have happened, they will also tell you that, by the way, this is a 60 channels and 10, 20 system, so that you know where exactly they have to be set. Uh, so one general question that is also a question uh, coming up on the Q&A is that, so what would be the number of electrodes required to do a reconstruction of brain map activity? And this really depends on the application. So this is essentially, this is a good question. And in order to a little bit open it up for everyone who are not familiar, one of the main things that we can do by using the EEG data or channels is that if we have more channel, then we know, well, then we can have a higher resolution information on what's happening inside of the brain. Let me give you a simple example. If I only have four channels and I put them one in the front, one on the back, one on the right, and one on the left, I can't say a lot other than these four positions, right? I can't, I can't say, for example, the most activity is coming from the front. But let's say instead of four, I have 61 channels. Then I have multiple on front, multiple on back. So with more detailed information, I can say where exactly on the front things are more happening. Is it on the front left or a front right and so on? So this, this is essentially is known as a mapping and I will show you an example in details on, on how brain mapping happens. And one common question that is also a question in here is that how many electrodes are enough in order to do a reconstruction of the brain activity? The number of electrodes is really dependent on the application and the accuracy of the data that you want. Usually under 19 electrodes is not really that useful to do the mapping because you don't have enough information to, con to show all the brain activity. But again, depending on the methods, it could be different. And I will, I will go into more details when I start talking about the uh, brain mapping. So, this was the first step of the pre-processing. So you already have one step in, in pre-processing and that was placement of the electrode. And when I start talking about EEG and brainstorm, I will show you how the knowledge of the placement could help you to do the pre-processing and getting the data ready for the analysis. That's what pre-processing essentially means. The second step of the pre-processing usually is making sure that the quality of the data is appropriate and the data have a good quality in order to be analyzed. So uh, first, let's, let's really say what these data are. Every line that you see in here, as I mentioned, is coming from a different sensor. So these are coming from different channels on the brain. So this is sensor one, sensor two, or channel one, channel two, and so on. But what are these data? they are showing a relative voltage. So as I said, brain activity are, are shown as the electrical impulses. What we are having in here is that in represented by using a sensors that can capture the voltage on the brain. And this voltage is related, meaning that we have to have a base that we call a zero. This could be a bone, let's say mastoid bone, that um, does not have electrical activity or it could be just an average of all of these. So it's a relative to other channels, the total of other channels. So that's the Y axis, the amplitude, and the X axis is the time. So we are having, when we have an EEG, we have a temporal information. We have at every sample of time, let's say as exactly at three, we are capturing a data of the brain at a specific time. Next sample, depending on the sampling rate, whatever number it could be, it will be the exact same brain activity at that specific time. So EEG in general is known to have a very high temporal resolution, meaning that if the task or the objective you're trying to look at happens very quickly, then you are required, it's better to use EEG. For example, let's say you want to measure the this or the time difference between your brain wants to grab something and your hands actually grab it. Or 
the time between you you see a ball coming toward you and you want to dodge and actually your brain your muscle movement causing you to dodge the ball if you're looking for something like this for example as an application then you can't really lose other type of in a brain modality such as the MRI or fMRI because they're not fast enough to capture the data. The speed that they capture the data is not high enough. While EEG have this, uh, this benefit of having higher temporal resolution. But there, there might be reasons that this data is messy. And this is almost always that their data is, is requires some pre-processing or cleaning before being used. The common ones are the actual instrument noise. So because these instruments are imperfect, there might be a noise due to the instrument. It could be a noise due to the outlet and et cetera. But the other type of noise, then these are the noise really caused by the participants themselves, could be things such as chewing and eye blink. So, and it's, and it's really interesting. If you take a look at these examples, these are not really um, the the uh, the muscle movement that we are capturing. These are still EEG movement, but which have been distorted due to the chewing. So as you chew, because of how close your chin to your brain is, this movement causes a distortion on the EEG data, and you see it like this. Lead noise is another example. Eye blink has also all of these spikes that you see is every blink. So every blink can cause a spike and Again, another interesting factors. You see the influence on this line and you don't see it on this line. And right away, I can argue that this is a frontal sensor. So the sensors that are sitting in, in front of the brain are these ones. That's why you can see the blinking while this is probably occipital or coming from the back of the head. That's why it doesn't really propagate the blinking on it. So one of the uh, tasks of, of a uh, person who is doing the analysis is to clean this data, remove the eye blink, remove the chewing, remove any additional noise, so we can have a better look at the brain before doing any sort of analysis. Uh, so before moving forward, as I am, as, as we are for, uh, going forward, I will answer Q and A's as uh, the ones that are uh, do not put us aside from, from the main topic. One good question right now is that are, are invasive methods high temporal like nearly? Yes, so uh, as, as I mentioned, the EEG itself, which is non-invasive, are sitting on top of the brain, have very high temporal information. And I advertise how EEG could be useful. But there is a downside to these data because of the distance they have within the, with the brain itself, so the distance from the brain to the actual sensor, the skull and other, other layers within the brain, they lower the quality of the brain. So what, even after all the pre-processing that I talk about, they are still um, low quality because of the propagation of the data from the brain to the sensor requires some energy and therefore in a way, some, some uh, smaller amplitude data will be lost. Now, a system or a method such as the work of Neuralink, which are doing deep brain stimulation, is that they're used doing the same thing as the EEG does, but invasive, meaning that instead of putting bigger sensors on the top of the skull, they make much smaller sensors and they actually implement it and put it on the surface of the cortex. This means that you still have high temporal information in an order of milliseconds or microseconds, but you will also have a very qual high quality data, which means that instead of looking at the gather of all the neurons that all together have to work out in order to pass and get to the neurons, you could really look at the 10 order of 10 neurons or 100 neurons at the same time. So it will be in addition of having a very high temporal resolution, you will get a very high spatial resolution. So for the part that you have the chip, you have a very, very higher accuracy information. And that's why those type of uh, data are able to really understand what exactly is happening at the brain at a sensory level 
and doing something like brain computer interface while EEG itself and what we are processing uh, talking about right now have a little bit of the downsides that maybe the data that we're looking for is not in here because it couldn't reach the top of the head. So uh, now the other thing that I will talk about, and this will come as an application and I will talk about it more is, and this is one example of the many things that you could do in the brain, which also came as one question is brain mapping. And that is using the sensors on the brain in order to estimate a location of what is happening inside of the brain. And this was really the topic of my research on the master. So this is also called brain source localization. Uh, and the task is that, okay, we have a really good um, temporal information, but we don't have a really high and um, accurate um, spatial resolution, meaning that we can kind of estimate things are happening in, in, in a, let's say, right side of the brain, but we can't really exactly pinpoint what region of the brain things are happening if we just look at these data, right? So let's say if these are my channels, if there is a blink, just by looking at this part, I can see that, okay, I, I can see the blink here. I can't see it on the other channel. So the blink is causing uh, this part of the brain uh, to, to light up or, or it, it propagated this part. Let's say there's an actual activity on the frontal lobe. You can see it in here, but you don't see it any other place. But by just looking at the EEG data and not having this brain map that I am showing you right now, you can't really say more than that about the location of where things are happening. So the goal of the brain source localization or brain mapping, which was my master work as well, is to just by looking at these data, are we able to, to make something like this? So the one that I'm showing right now, which means can we really pinpoint and say exactly where in when, what regions in the brain things are happening or not? And this can be useful for many reasons. For example, if again, we're studying things such as a memory, such as a behavior, we can really say what regions of the brain involved in that task. Or let's say if something such as a seizure happened, then um, the, the surgeon, by doing this sort of analysis could really know where exactly in the brain the seizure is happening. So they don't have to open all the brain. They can just um, make a break in a small portion of the brain where they already know where things are happening. So, so the challenge is that we have this temporal data in the, and this isn't again, brain source localization analysis. And we want to find uh, where spatially things are happening. We want a spatial data within the brain. I will talk about this part in much more details in the analysis aspect, but this is the main, so what I just talked about is the main thing that I wanna go through in uh, introducing the toolboxes such as AEG Lab and Brainstorm. So we talked about uh, pre-processing, such as selecting the channels, locating them correctly. We also talked about uh, removing the noise. So these are the pre-processing and the main task could be many things, the example that I'm showing in here is a brain source localization, which is having the EEG data. We wanna locate where exactly in the brain things are happening. And what I wanna show you right now is that although there has been a lot of research, work, engineering, and math on developing the algorithm or the methods that could, you could benefit, if your task is analyzing the brain data, because of how these, there are tools that make things simpler, you don't really need to rebuild everything. So the goal of the any toolbox, including the toolbox that I am talking about, is that uh, we are using these toolboxes so we can ease the process and have a, a faster process and do less coding. So it will be the goal is less coding, more analyzing. There, there are a couple of uh, toolboxes in a different um, coding platform for brain analysis. And uh, the two ones that I found very useful during my master's were EEG Lab and Brainstorm. First, I'm gonna talk about EEG Lab a little bit, and then I'm gonna dig deeper by using uh, Brainstorm. So I think we have already sent this out. Um, so you can just search EEG Lab download 
and, and you will be asked to fill in a form. Once you fill in the form, you're able to download it. And once you download it, you get a zip file. So what then you should do, and this was again a question that came uh, at the first, at the beginning, is that you should define the directory of the MATLAB, same directory of the EEG file. So if you have a folder on your computer, on the top of the folder, you see a directory information, right? All you have to do is to either, to open up the MATLAB, copy that directory and paste it in here. And this way you have changed it and you press enter. This way you have changed the directory of the MATLAB to where the EEG lab is. So you should be able in the EEG lab toolbox, which is depending on a version, will may have a different number in here. You will see EEG lab.m and some data samples, some plugins and etc. The toolbox itself is EEG lab. So you could either double click on this, run it, or on the command line, if you just write EEG lab and press enter, it will, it will automatically open up this software-like interface. So these are toolboxes with the uh, user interface that helps you to um, work with the data without really needing to code every line. So they have already coded things for you and make it in a way that you can use it, similar to any other software or application that you have used. Obviously, the first step is to uh, upload the data uh, in important in EEG lab. If you click on a file, import data, then you will be able to import the data depending on the type of data. Now, one thing that um, is still a challenge and may take some time when you're doing analysis is importing the data with the proper format. So almost all different type of um, instruments of EEG, which are the EEGs that do the recording, save the file on a different format. So depending on the format that they have saved it, you have to upload it in order to be able to read it. Uh, these are some common formats for the EEG, and uh, .eeg, .cmt, ASCII file, sometimes text, sometimes a MATLAB array, .seeg, all of these are formats. So depending on the samples of the data you have or the, the, the formats that the data have been recorded, you have to import the data using one of these. The one that I have seen most common is the EDF, which is the last one that, that you see in this file. But right now to make things easier and for you to have something to start from, I recommend you to instead of importing the data, click on the load existing data set option. So EEG lab, once you download it, already come with the sample EEG data. So you can get a, a, get a hands-on experience right away. So if you do a load existing data from the file, you will click and this will open up a new browser that you can search for a new data. The same location that you have downloaded the data and open up the MATLAB, uh, EEG, you're able to see a folder called sample underlying uh, data. And you can see two different type of data, uh, or maybe one, but there will be definitely something with dot set format. So dot set format are the formats of the EEG lab itself. So if you have already done something in EEG lab, let's say you did some pre-processing, but then you want to do the processing tomorrow, or someone else has to do the processing, you can just save it as the EEG MATLAB format, and then next person can open it. And the format is called dot set. So just open up the EEG lab underline data dot set. And uh, right away, what you will see is some information changing from zero and none to different things. Most important one is that we have 32 channels in this specific data, okay? But then what this data is missing is a couple of things. And these are the things that I talked about in the pre-processing part. Channel location and reference are the two main things. So first off with the channel location, it says no, so we have to change it and make sure that the channel locations are also provided. Again, while providing a channel location with this specific system, we are adding this additional information that we know this specific channel one is capturing the data from the surface of the brain, okay? Uh, so there's one question that does EEG lab is able to open EDF file format? Yes, so if I go back in the import files, the last 
type is the EDF, and you can therefore open it up on the EDF format as well. Uh, so if in case that the channels is off, you, you, it says no, if it says yes, then it means that the channels uh, are already there. But if you're not sure if, because these are 32 channels, if you're not sure the channels are right, you can re-upload it. But sometimes, especially if the already recording has been done using EEG Lab, they already come with it. So sometimes all you have to do is just to upload the data, uh, import the data, and with the data, embeds come the location. So if in your if in your locations you see yes, it means that it's already been uploaded. But I'm covering the case that if it's no, so your data is coming from somewhere that channels are not there. So in this case, we have to upload the we have to let the system know where the channels are coming from, okay? In order to let uh, to add this embedded information, that channel one is let's say in the front, channel two is on occipital, and so on. So under the event channel location, uh, you are able to browse, uh, and uh, there is a um, model that you have to define for the brain. And I, I will get to this in more details, um, but the model is that, so because we wanna really show the location in a 3D geometric of the brain, we can really, we can, we want to really say where exactly these locations are, we have to have a model of how the brain looks, how the skull and the skull looks like. So how does the head look like? So the channels can sit on the head. And these are called the forward modeling or modeling the brain, modeling the skull, right? Uh, the, the most simplified versions are just assuming that the head is just a sphere, multiple layers of sphere, so not looking at the ups and downs, the, uh, the irregular shapes of the skull and the head, just assuming that this is a sphere. And this is what you're seeing here. Sometimes, depending on the application, you don't have to go as detailed as um, finding the actual head model. You could just use for uh, the, the sphere model. So this is what has been here. But if you click on this, then you will be able to uh, browse the files, again, in the same location that we had the sample data, we have a sample lot, which is samples of the electrode position. Once you click on that, then you will be introduced into a different type of EEG channels. If your type, number of the electrodes you're looking for is not in the list, then you can always go and download it online. The format should be dot lock for most of the uh, toolboxes, and that's what they're using. So all you have to do is you have to look and ask the individuals who have recorded the data what type of system they're using, 1010, 2010, or what, and then you have to download the corresponding EEG lo location, um, electrode locations with the same number of electrodes. So this is 32 electrodes, so this is the one that I'm looking for. Now, once you click on that, the next question is, okay, now you told me that it's 32 electrodes and in this LOX file, I have 32 names for different electrodes and I have their position on the coordinates of X, Y, Z. Now, the next question is, do you want to label the these names and do you want to locate them one by one or not? And the most, the, the most, the easiest way and the way that actually works is to just uh, first read the locations and then click on the read the locations and then click auto detect. This means that uh, the type of data that I'm working with, the number of channels and the electrode positioning, it's the common, it's common, and I don't really have to do it by hand. So if you're, let's say, you are using um, seven channels, which is an uncommon number of channels. You have to edit the existing files of the electro positioning and you have to really define on the X, Y, Z coordinates on where these locations should go so it matches the actual recording. But in the cases that you're using yeah, already uh, standard number of electrodes, standard electro EEG cap, then just using auto detect is enough. And what it really does is it makes sure that the name of the electrodes, their positioning on the coordinates of the X, Y, Z 
of the head model is where they should be. So once you click on the uh, author detect, you will also see a yes on the channel locations, which means that we have successfully set the channel location. The next factor, which is also something that I talked about, uh, is the, um, the reference. So what, I, what we talked about is that we said uh, reference is defined, defines um, the, 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 the amplitude of the each data uh, with respect to something. So when we say the amplitude, let's say is three millivolts at this at, at this specific time at this specific channel, this three millivolts should be with respect to something, and that that will be the reference of the data we are taking. So in order to find to get the reference, we will click on tools and then we will redo a re-reference. And once you click on this re-reference you're able to choose how you want to re-reference the data. As I said, you could use something, uh, some other electrodes, such as if let's say you put an electrodes on the bone, on the mastoid bone, then because there's no really electrical activity there, it, it's right on back of the head, there is a bone in, on, um, on back of the ear. If you put it there, there's no electrical activity there. So that could be a reference or the baseline of where the data should be compared to that. Or if you don't have that, or if you want a more rigorous method, you could just average the data and say that my reference is compared to the average of the data. Uh, so, so that's that. Now there is one question again uh, in the Q and A. Uh, does EEG lab um, uh, have a allows the uh, real-time uh, data recording or not. I am not sure about that. Most of the times, no, most of the times, uh, the instrument that you're using to collect the data also comes with the specific software that shows you a real-time analysis. I am pretty sure the brainstorm that I will talk about have something for the real data capture uh, plotting and analysis, but I have never used the data in a real time. So, and I will talk about this in more details, but what we will, what we usually do when we are collecting the data is that if the reason that we want a real time data plotting is that we could show or spot specific things that happened, what we do is we set the flag at that specific time. Let's say, we have a patient who may get a seizure and we are recording them, monitoring them. As soon as they get a seizure, while we are recording the EEG, we will put a flag on the, uh, that specific time span, span. And we say, this is where the EEG starts. And I will show this, uh, show the example of that in this processes. But uh, that's why most of the time it's beneficial to just to go with the software that allows you to do the instrument recording as well. Uh, because uh, those are more um, more feet set for real time uh, plotting. Uh, so so again, in here, what we have to do is we have to do a re referencing, and most common way is to use uh, compute average. So we select that and we uh, select OK. Then we also can see that we have a reference as an average as well. This could be electrode again on a, on a bone or average if there's no electrode. Now, next thing that it also says no in here is the ICA weight. So for the people who are not familiar, um, there's a very popular algorithm called independent component analysis. And what the independent component analysis does is that it takes the data uh, into a different space provides it with the different representation with the objective of uh, separating data with the random characteristic from non-random characteristics. So we refer to the random characteristics in the statistics as a Gaussian distribution. So the goal of ICA is to uh, map the data or project the data in a space that, that it could separate the data with the Gaussian distribution. And those are the data that usually represent uh, noise. So 
This is one main common use of an EEG analysis is to use independent component analysis or ICA to separate the noise from the data. And this is why it's been here. So this is one of the, the two steps that we just talked about are the steps of pre-processing for channel location and setting up the channels. ICA and other algorithms that I will just show you is for pre-processing. So if you go to the tools, you can see run ICA and it gives you, um, and it provides you the ICA. Again, you don't really need to understand the uh, ICA algorithm. You don't need to code it. All of them has already been implemented in the, uh, the toolbox. That's why it's more uh, useful. But I want you to also take a look at other things. And as you can see, these are other type of pre-processing that we can do. So the, one of the main jobs of the person who is doing the uh, analysis is to look at the data and your expertise will be uh, estimating or hypothesizing what type of pre-processing is more appropriate. For example, if there is a specific channel that, let's say the sensor hasn't been connected properly and it's very noisy, then you have to do channel rejection. So you have to say, I like all of these channels, the data that I'm getting from these channels are great, but I'm gonna remove this specific channel because this is very noisy compared to any other channel. Okay? So uh, the other things, for example, re-referencing, interpolating electrodes, rejection of continuous data by eye. So this is when, uh, let's say during the processes, you, you saw a moment that the participant uh, scratched their head or moved their head around to see something. That scratching, that head movement directly affects the quality of EEG and disrupts the EEG a lot. So if you have already had that in mind or flagged the time, you could just take a look at the data, look at, and by I just say, I know this portion of the data is useless, I have to cut it out, because this is the part that when the user scratched their head. So you could look at the data, and this is what it means by reject continuous data by I, is you look at the map or the data, and then you select a window, you say, I want to delete this window from my data. So all of these comes as a part of the, uh, uh, EEG lab. So these are all the um, pre-processing that you could do in EEG lab. Uh, so the other question is now there may happen that you see rejected data by ICA. You just just run ICA. Uh, I am I don't quite remember how these two are different. What I can tell you is that run ICA is just going to transpose the data to a different space. And as I mentioned, this space can uh, have a data distribution in a different way. It doesn't really exclude the data that are noisy. That will be the next step of after exporting the, uh, and projecting the data into a different space. Then you can see what, which one of them are more Gaussian representation, remove them. So maybe if I correct, um, remember correctly, reject data using ICA, also have the ICA as well as removing step of the ICA after. Um, uh, so the next question is removing trends and motion noises are done through ICA or is it done through other different ways? And this goes back to the, again, the decision that you as the analyst and analyzer of the data have to make. Uh, if there is a, and, and this is the main difference. So, so the, uh, let, me, let me rephrase the question and maybe this helps a, a little bit on, okay, how, when, when do you think as a, as a person who is analyzing the data, when it's a good time to remove the whole window of the data because there was a scat, uh, um, scratching head? And when is a good time to, instead of removing the whole window, is to use ICA instead? And are they different at all or not? Um, so when you're selecting a specific window and you're removing that specific window, you're removing everything that has happened within that time interval. Let's say from time 10 to 15, you decided this is the five second time that the user scratched their head. 
you're going to, if you remove the whole time data, then you will have no information from that data whatsoever. Sometimes this is absolutely fine because um, there is no valuable information on that five second, but sometimes you can't afford removing all the data from the sample. Let me give you another example. Let's say the, seizure, the user is having a seizure. Most of the time, as well as the seizure, there will be a movement of the head. Now, the, the, our goal is to locate where in the brain the seizure is happening, while exactly at the same, same time, our data is getting disrupted and getting noisy because of the movement of the head. If you would use the time windows removing the data, then you will remove everything uh, about the um, seizure as well. So you will have no EEG data. But if you use other methods such as ICA, PCA, SSP, these are all other different methods. They project the data into a different dimension. And depending on the objectives they have, meaning that depending on how, with what objective they are transposing the data or moving the data in another representation, you may be able to remove the noise or the head movement without removing the actual um, the actual uh, EEG data. For example, so the other example, this is like one of one of the conferences papers that I had during my master's. We we looked at removing the eye blink without removing the EEG underlying the eye blink. So what we know is that the let's say specific channels, as you blink, there are spikes and caused by a, a eye. But we want to remove that blink itself without removing all the information within that data. So the common way is to use ICA in order to project the data. Then the next question, and this is the question that my work tries to answer is that, okay, you have 19 channels, you project the data into different dimensions, you still have 19 channels, but the data representation is different. How many you have to remove? from those channels, because when you remove them, you're not removing the whole data, you're removing a portion of the dimension. How many dimensions you have to remove? And this was the questions that one of my work was trying to, to answer in the form of the projection. So the, again, the type of the analysis you do really depends on uh, your decision as the person who, who, who is in charge in the analysis on what are the things you have to do. Uh, so the other question is, is, is time, um, is, is the, the only option with the noises is to remove that time window? Uh, no. So as I just described, uh, the type of data we have is the temporal data, it's EEG, but you don't have to just remove the specific time. Uh, you could use methods that cause the projection of the data into a different dimension to remove some that dimension or some aspects of data without removing other parts. And you could essentially do the similar type of other analysis that you, any, any sort of um, uh, pre-processing or denoising that you can do with the um, temporal data or the time-based data you could do with EEG. So EEG is no different from other time-based. So if you understand how to analyze EEG, it's the same way you could analyze stock data because that is still with respect to time, the same analysis or the same methods could be used to analyze EMG data, which is for the muscle movement, ECG data, which is for the heart movement and so on. So as long as the method or the algorithm is, does the process with respect to time or can be performed on the uh, time data, then you can use it as a pre-processing, and that's the decision of the person who is doing this analysis to decide. Okay, so last thing about the EEG before I move on to the uh, 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 the brainstorm is that, so all the tools are essentially here. There are so many different types of plots that you could do. You could look at the data just with respect to time. You could look at the spectral and maps of the brain. You could look at the uh, time frequency, you could look at different frequencies, and all of these are in here. 
if if you have a specific events you could highlight those events and then just look at them and this is just some examples of what you can see so on the on the down left corner you can see uh, channels with respect to time uh, these are by the way the time stamps that i just talked about in the, in in uh, green and red you can see the time stamps that were set or the flags that were set these are the parts that the clinicians wanted to tell us to pay attention to because something happened there. This is a spectral density plot for a specific three different channels. And this is a time frequency representation of the data. There's so many more you can do with it. Which ones you have to choose? I think it's gonna be a little bit outside of the scope of this work because there are so many aspects you have to keep into the consideration. And it goes back to the question of what is exactly you wanna do in order to answer that. Before uh, moving to the lab view, the other thing that I wanted to show is the management uh, of the EEG extensions. And so if you're an engineer, if you're someone who's focused on developing algorithm, let's say biomedical engineers, uh, and you're working on the EEG data, you may work uh, aside uh, a clinician to help them to do a diagnosis or you may work in a part that you want to develop new algorithms or methods or uh, provide mathematical representations, pre-processing and processing parts that could help increase our understanding and the quality of the data. And this is goes to the uh, many, many engineers who have already worked on this field already. And you can access their work. They may have developed their algorithm for EEG lab, and you, you're able to access them. So if you go to manage EEG lab extension, data processing extension, then you will see a list of um, algorithms that are not already that installed, but you can install them. So depending on what you want to do, for example, linear modeling for EEG, nonlinear filtering, IRR filter, uh, guided selection of ICA, automatic detector, um, and clean, clean continuous data using artificial subspace reconstruction. So many people, many different people came up with different methods and which in papers, as if you read uh, uh, EGCNR processing papers, they're focused on explaining what they have done, how they have done it, it's better than what better than what algorithms when it's on what occasion it should be used. So, if you're interested, then you could look at this. It's not just these. There are so many next pages to it, and you, if you go on, you will you may find the things that you're looking for, or you may find things that you haven't looked before, but you you find them useful. Uh, so this is this is the end of the first part talking about the EEG lab. Uh, the second one that I want to introduce is the brainstorm, and the brainstorm is another uh, MATLAB tool, which is used for the analysis uh, of the brain data, and it's been uh, developed by McGill University. So, in specifically, so that we could, it, it's it's a little bit more fun to watch, and maybe a little bit more fun to analyze instead of repeating the same process and showing how pre-processing and, and processing could happen on the brainstorm, because the brainstorm has also have a similar um, tools, I will go to an application of brain source localization. And again, this is essentially detecting where in the brain things are happening, having the EEG on top of the brain. This is by itself is a challenging question and I'm gonna say why. And if you're ready, I'm, I wanna introduce one and only equation that I will be introducing in this book. And this is this following linear equation. So the equation is M equals HJ plus um, right theta, or it could have the same representation with different notation. But this is the main question that if anyone who wanna start brain source localization or sometimes more generally, linear inverse modeling. This is the equation that you will be starting with. So what this equation says is that I have M as my uh, measurement or the data that I have collected. And this measurement is constructed from combination of the sources within the brain shown with J 
multiplied by d or the projection of this data cascade and projection of this data from the brain through the skull and everything to the brain while in addition we have this additional virus data which is the noise which hopefully we will uh, as much as possible denoise under the pre-processing so this is the main and the only equation that um, you have to look at for today and um, that that is the main equation used for brain source localization so the question is i have this measurement as you can see in here and i know and i assume that this measurement is coming from the sources within the brain that has been projected through the different layers such as the skull and etc and has been absorbed or been recorded by this measurement and shown by it. so it's a j brain source multiplied by h the the representation of the brain or the skull okay with virus data which is a noise so there will be a noise definitely in all recordings and i am showing it in here now why is this a challenging question and why it's worth um, engineers and, and mathematicians and uh, computer scientists neuroscientists to try to answer or solve this question here's why so and i'm going to show you the details of the notation but m as a measurement as i mentioned earlier is between let's say 20, 19, or 10 at lowest, to the highest, a thousand channels, right? But for J, the source in the brain, they are millions. To make it a little bit more simplified, we could put grids, as you can see in here. So this is without the grid. This is when I lay down a grid on the brain. You could grid the brain into a smaller triangle, and you can say each of these triangles, which could be a thousand uh, to a hundred uh, actual neurons is the resolution that I'm looking for. So I'm not looking for individual neurons, which is obviously you can you cannot get it with the scope EEG, but you can look at the little bit more detailed version. So each of these triangles is one of the J sources that I'm looking for. Okay. Now here's the challenge. This is let's say 10 to 20 to 100 to a thousand channels. Why this one, the sources are 10,000, 100,000 small triangles. So number of knowns, which are my EEG channels, is much, no, much lower than number of the unknowns, which are the sources within the brain. This means that the problem based on the linear algebra is not solvable because number of unknowns is more. Now what we do, is we look at the methods, mathematical representation that could estimate what will be the actual J. We can't really know the J, but we could estimate it. So this is just a notation, uh, again, over for the people who are interested a little bit more mathematical representation. M is our measurement, is a vector for every sample of time. So note that N is a sample of time. So for let's say 0 0.01, this is the result, 0 0.02, this is the measurement result for so for every sample of time n, m is a vector that is n e by one, which is number of electrodes by one. So we just have number of electrodes. J is a source, so it's a lay, it's a grid that we set on the brain. It's the small triangles that we put on the brain. These are n s by one, so it's the source vector. Again, it's a vector. H, obviously for this math to make sense, H is NE by NS. So when NE by NS gets multiplied by NS by one, we get NE by one. So H is NE by NS, which is also called forward modeling or gain matrix. And lastly, where theta is also N by S, so uh, N, N by E, sorry in order to match this equation is the additive noise that we have on each channel. Uh, so as I mentioned, the main issue or the main challenge which makes this problem interesting is that the number of unknowns is between 1,000 to 20,000 depending on how accurate your resolution you want, while the number of knowns is 10 by 100. Therefore, this question 
based on a simple algebra is not solvable. It's called underdetermined and ill-posed problem. So what we do as an engineers or what I do under as my master is I looked at this problem, looked at the existing solution and tried to think a way that we could have a better estimation for J, meaning that closer to the true J by just having the measurement. Uh, so I'm not going to bore you or go into the details of um, what are the methods, how they do it. This is in general called inverse problem. So if you're interested in the mathematics part, uh, just search for linear inverse modeling or linear inverse problem. And uh, you will probably see so many methods. So there are some Bayesian methods, some uh, other types of subspace methods, other different types of methods that we could estimate the J. I'm not going to go into the details, but this is what we will do. So what we will do is that we will try to use uh, my, uh, the toolbox, brainstorm toolbox, in order to just having the measurement, we want to say where location in the brain things are happening. This method or this, um, this, in order to construct this equation or in order to be able to solve this equation, we have to fully define J. So we have to, using the toolbox, define the grids because essentially the code itself or the data itself has no meaning of the grids, no meanings of any other information other than there's some time with respect to voltage. So what I will show you is that on the brain store, how you can define J or the grid that you're setting on the brain. So you obviously have a, have a representation of the brain first and you have to put a grid on it. How you can define H, which is the gain matrix or the forward modeling that describes what happens through when you when the uh, source wanted to go and be, become a measurement, and so that's that's the main part that we want to show. And once we do this, I will show you how we can estimate the location of the brain. Uh, so similar to the EEG lab brainstorm, you can download it. And uh, if you get to this page after filling a form, download the zip file itself, which in, contains the actual. Uh, uh, the actual uh, software or the actual toolbox, but also download sample epilepsy, which is again, we will use an example in order to have our first hand experience with uh, analyzing the data. Similarly, you have to unzip the file and then change the directory. So this is a directory, just change it instead of EEG lab uh, to the brainstorm. So I put them both in EEG toolboxes, but uh, instead of going to EEG lab, I go to the brainstorm and then I open up brainstorm tree. This is what we are looking for, and you could either run it, so click on it, you will see this and then run, or you just type it in here because it's in a directory, it will open it up. Personally, I like Brainstorm better than EEG Lab because I'm very fan of user interfaces and, and a big fan of doing things as simple as possible. Brainstorm, in my opinion, is much more simple. The other important factor, so if you're serious about AEG analysis, is that they have uh, on the same website that you download the data, they have a form that uh, it's a community form. Uh, you can ask your questions. I think within 24 hours, or, or at most less than a three days, there's someone from Brainstorm Group who will be helping you if you don't know how to do things or the specific thing you're looking for. I don't think I would graduate if there wasn't a form for this because there's so many things you could do in this toolboxes and this the speed of the help and response I get from community helped me a lot to be able to figure things out soon and, and do more on my master. So this is the pipeline that we will follow. Uh, and our goal again is brain source localization. This is again the uh, pipeline that is uh, uh, introduced and suggested by Brainstorm, this, the, the toolbox itself to follow in order to do the source localization. So let's take a, have a quick look and then I will dig into each of them one by one. Um, we have the EG data, so obviously we have to import the data, we have to import the channels, we have to locate the channels, similar thing we did in the EEG lab. Same thing, so this is setting up the sensor, setting up the data itself. Because we want to have a brain and we want to put a grid on top of the brain and show the source, 
we need to define anatomy of the brain and we will use the, do this by using MRI data of the individual. We will combine the brain anatomy and sensors and co-register them so there is a really good match between the sensor location and the brain itself. So let's say my fist is a brain and we are putting a sensors here. I have to, in terms of a coordinate, 3D coordinates, I have to align them perfectly. So if this is specific sensors is activated, I know exactly under it what region of the brain it is activated. So this is what happens under the co-registration. Once we combine anatomy and sensor to get the co-registration, we will use it with the EEG data in order to the source estimate. And hopefully this is what we will be able to do for uh, the next half an hour. Um, so first is setting a sensor on EEG. This is something we have done before. First thing I will do is go to the file, new subject, click on the new subject, give it a name, and there's two options you have in here. If the individual that you want to do source estimation, you already have MATLAB, uh, sorry, if you already have MRI data for them, select yes, use, uh, sorry, select no individual anatomy will be used. Uh, but if you don't have the MRI data of the individual, but you still want to have an estimate of how their brain is or what those sources are activated, use yes use protocol default anatomy. So what this means is that if I have individual uh, anatomy of the person, I will use their specific anatomy based on their specific brain in order to construct a model of their brain. But if the anatomy of their brain is not available, there are there is a tool in the brainstorm that has already someone made a average anatomy. So they have combined and averaged multiple people brain MRI, and then they have constructed an MRI which they say average individual should have a brain look like this. That will be used as a default anatomy. So obviously it's not gonna be as accurate as your own anatomy or, or your own MRI data, but it's the average representation. So it's good enough and still can help you to make the construction. This specific example, because we downloaded from the brainstorm, it already has the brain anatomy, so we're not going to use it. So we click on a file, new subject, and we give it a name, depending on if you have an MRI or not, you're going to select one of the two default anatomy options, and then this will open up. First thing you got to do is import the data. You could either click on import EEG or MEG, or click on review raw file. I usually use review raw file, and this is what is recommended in the brainstorm itself. Once you click on it, if you have downloaded the data correctly, you will see two files, one called data, the other called anatomy. If you select the data, you can upload it. Similar to um, EEG, you can have different type of data uh, formats. So you could, uh, this one is .math file, but if there's different format, you just click on this, there's so many options that you can use from EDF files and et cetera, and you can choose from those. So for example, if you click on the data, this specific data is .bin. So you have to go to the file types and select the one that is .bin, and it's for EEG, not MEG, because this data is EEG. Once you click on it, you open it, you will be able to see the data. If you double click now on the data, you will see the data. So this is the data. If you remember, I talked about flags or the timestamps that the clinician put. These are some of the flags that you see for this specific individual. As you can also see in here, there is the 41 channels and we have all the channels from CP1 to QL. Now these names, if you just search them up, these are defining specific locations of the brain. So O4, O3, O4 is the occipital, T is the, I think, temporal bone, F is a frontal, and so on. So if you remember, the next step after uploading the data is to import channels. So the channels and their location is fitted perfectly. So if you right click on the, this one, which is for the channels and do add EEG positions, import from file, you can import your channel. Again, if you don't have those specific channels, Brainstorm already have three type of uh, 
standards and you could use them to define channels. So Colin 27, it has for 69 channels, for I don't know, 19 channels or and so on. So if you don't have a specific channels provided to you, you can first take these specific ones. But again, this example is a really good example because it already have the channels. So I do import tutorial electrodes that ELC is the extension that is for the channels. Once we click, we have the EEG channels as well. So we have already have the EEG channels and sensors check mark. Next step is to anatomy part. So uh, one good thing is that Brainstorm has separated the functionality from the anatomy and you could see it uh, at the top left corner so the one that we were on so far where functionality which is where we define the function the uh, time resolution data if there is mri surface data anatomy parts it's the other tab that i have here so you click on that it will take you to a similar tab but a different you will have a name of the subject which in this case is called a uh, toolbox anatomy default anatomy you right click on the subject 0.1, which is the name that we gave at first, and we do import anatomy folder. The sample already have the anatomy. If it didn't, you have to import the, uh, the either MRI itself or the free surface folder, which is the processed MRI. So once you click on that, this is a very good question. So it's already known as we are clicking on the anatomy, it says, okay, Obviously, if you need the anatomy of the MRI for the analysis of brain EEG data, you are asking this because you want to construct a model of the brain. And the way we construct a model of the brain with the small triangles that I talked about. So the question is, how many triangles do you want? And this defines the accuracy or the resolution. The more, the higher number you select, the smaller the triangles and the higher the resolution. The lower number of triangles, lower resolution, bigger triangle. The common one is 15,000, which is the default one as well. And this will be the number of uh, small triangles that will be used in order to construct the brain model. So this is the grid that we are setting on the brain. So we select the 15,000, now it provides us with the MRI. So this is the actual MRI of the individual. Now, this is the question we want to answer. We want to build the brain representation. In order to do that, the algorithm asks us to, there are specific uh, points on the brain. If you show me those points, then I can exactly understand where is the front, where is the back, where is the right, where is the left, then I will make the whole brain based on that. But just by looking at the data, automatically cannot make it yet. So the algorithm requires you to manually set specific point and then say what these points are, um, which ones are which. So this is where it's shown. So under the uh, fiducial, you can see NAS, LPA, RPA, AC, PC, and H. These are the ones that you have to, with the pointer, go and click and select. To be honest, I personally don't know what they are. I used to know, but I don't know them now. But if you go to the brainstorm tutorials or if you search them online, what is the NAS on the MRI, it can show you the picture. All you have to do is to play, play around with these in order to find a specific location. And then once you click it, it will be set. So you just click on the set. When this pointer is exactly on where it, the NAS is, you click set and it will be set. And this will be what it looks like. So for example, specifically AC, you find that it should be this position on this three angles, and then you click on the set, and it will be a red dot that is being shown there. So you have to this for, for example, this one is RPA, is I think it's the right part on, um, close to the ear, so this is the ear, this is where you have to select, and these are the other locations uh, on the different MRI pictures, and you select the set, they will be selected. So once you do this for all of the data, again, repeating the same process for all, all six parameters, you will have something like this. And this is a representation of your brain. So this is the using MRI, we model the brain. This is the brain that we model, and it's a model based on uh, 15,000 small 
um, triangles that we use. Now that we have the anatomy and this anatomy is used to construct the model, we will combine the sensor anatomy and co-register them, meaning that we will make sure that the sensor location and the brain anatomy are fixed and exactly on top of each other. So a specific channel is activated, it shows exactly, uh, matches exactly where on the brain things are happening. To do that, we go back to the functional part under the channels, under the MRI registration, we click edit, and you will see that automatically this hasn't been really set properly. So these are channels, this is the head, right now it's, it's on the air, they have to sit exactly on the brain. Now luckily, if you uh, click on the MRI registration, edit, luckily uh, there are some options in here for you to change it. For the cases that I was um, looking at during my uh, work, as a master's student, and specifically this sample, the refining uh, automatic point, uh, automatic refining is good enough estimation. So if you just click on this refine registration using head point, what it does is compares the head point and the electrode point, and it will position them together. And if you do that, as you can see, channels are exactly sitting on where they should be sitting for the 41 channels EEG. So as, as long as they are in the surface of the head and they are positioned with the distances that make sense, you're probably doing it right. So all I did was I clicked on the registration edit and then refining registration, then press okay and I got it. Okay. Great, so now we have the channel themselves. We have defined the re register and put them together. Next step is to compute the head model. If you remember, we had H in our formula, which was a representation of the head. It was explaining how the sources from the brain, from the triangles we just defined, can propagate and get to the actual sensors. We do this through the process called uh, forward modeling, and it's, uh, it, what it does is computes the head model. So we right click on the channels again, this time we click on the compute head model. We will be asked for different type of things we do. Similar to EEG lab, you could define the whole brain based on the three spheres of uh, same conductivity. And this is called three or four shell sphere. The next question is, do you want uh, to just uh, define or assume the data is setting on the cortex of the brain, or are there any data inside of the brain as well? And this goes back to your assumptions, hypothesis, and your understanding about the brain. My hypothesis was that the neurons that cause activation and are captured from the sensors on the locations on the top of the brain, which, are, we can, which means we can capture them with EEG, are the neurons that are uh, pyramidal and they are perpendicular to the surface of the head. Therefore, the cortex representation is enough. And this is the argument that I have seen come up a lot in the brain representation or brain mapping. But again, maybe if you're looking for something that requires an in-depth look at the brain, you could look at the MRI volume and that gives you option to not look at only surface of the brain, but also what is happening inside. For the sake of your time and in order for, for you to just have experience, if you select this three shell sphere, it will quickly construct the health model. However, there are other options in here, such as boundary element method and finite element method. And instead of, for those cases, instead of just assuming that the brain is a tree spheres together, they really look at the conductivity of the different layers of the brain. So then you will be asked, what do you think is the conductivity of this skull? And if you know those information, obviously it can help you a lot in having a better estimation uh, because this is a representation of how the sources are propagated. But if you don't and you want a quick modeling of the brain, three shell sphere is used. If you want more accurate, then use boundary element method or final element method based on which one is available. But you will be asked to estimate what is the thickness of the brain or the conductivity of the skull. It has a predefined value, but you can change that as well. So let's say we select the three, three shell sphere. 
this is what we mean by straight uh, three spheres together all the brain it's been represented by the three spheres and this is the defining the h or the head model now that we have everything we need all we have to do is to do a source estimate so that would be the last step but before going there i wanted to uh, talk more about what i promised and that was the flags and the uh, the time stamps that we talked about for example let's say we are looking at the epilepsy which is the case of this um, specific examples we have a data and for most of the data the participants is sleeping but at some point epilepsy will happen the person who is capturing this data either automatically or manually they will stamp and they say there is the event is happening at this specific time we usually call these events events related potential meaning or, or rep meaning that the brain activity or the related potential of the brain is happening at this specific event. We are not looking at the resting state, we're looking at ERP or event related potential. Because this event has been marked properly by the subject, we can click on the file and then do the add events file and we can add these events specifically. This part, I'm just re-showing you the things that we could do, we did in the EEG lab. So if you go to the artificial uh, art artifacts, you can do things that you could do on the EEG and sometimes more. And that is detection of the heartbeat, EEG uh, eye blinks, custom event, heartbeats. If you see data like that, uh, the artifact could be removed. So again. I clicked on the re-referencing EEG and use averaging to re-reference the data. I also used other things such as the ICA to remove uh, additional noises if needed. Last step before doing the construction is this. So remember that when we are doing the source localization, we wanna say what location of the brain has been activated, okay? Now, let's say we have a seizure. In order to us, for us to have a higher accuracy on that this, we say this specific data is for a seizure, not the normal brain activity, we have to tell the system that what is the representation of normal activity or what is the representation of noise in this case. So the brain, the epilepsy or the EEG that is causing epilepsy is our interest. Anything other than that is a noise. So the recording parts that nothing is happening could be assumed as a noise. And, and if we construct the covariance matrix of this noise, then our, as our method has some assumption when doing the source localization on, on what part of the EEG that you're seeing is the, just the brain activity, what part of it is this caused by seizure. So in order to do this, in order to give this additional information as a noise covariance, we right click on the EEG data, we select noise covariance, and then we select compute from data. You will see this windows. And what we are trying to say is that, for example, in this case, from 110 and 160, it's a 60 seconds that I'm 100% sure nothing has happened here. It was just a normal person sleeping, nothing special. So this will be the baseline, and this will be the representation of what is not seizure. And once we get this data, and this is by the way just used for some algorithm, but you have to give something anyway for the method to work, you could use identity matrix if you don't wanna give something. Then after that, you right click on the head model and you click compute a source. This is where the source localization happened. There are many different methods in the source localization. The most important one is called S. Loretta. Uh, we are constructing S. Loretta in this specific case. Um, by considering that the, um, with the constraint or with the assumption that the neurons are perpendicular and they are normal or perpendicular with respect to the cortex. We assume that they are not moving around, they are fixed. And um, you don't really need to uh, worry about the details of this. This, other than this, Loretta is the most popular one is the most very clear. Once we construct it, we get something like this that you also saw at the first slide. And this is the brain source localization. So the seizure in this case, we know that has happened on the occipital lobe on the back of the brain. 
Now this information is very valuable because we can give this to the, clin to the surgeon and say, we know this is where you have to apply or this is where the seizure is. So if you wanted to, uh, I don't know, do some sort of surgery, this is the location you have to open. You don't have to open the rest of the brain. Now, just as a last slide, as a, as a bonus part, if you are interested as a researcher, uh, again, to work on the algorithm aspects, these are coming from uh, individuals and engineers who have developed the algorithm. So on the toolbox, so what you can do as an engineer is not to only work with the interface, but you could actually go and play around with the code. You can exactly see how the codes of everything has been implemented. The ICA, the brain source organization, the head modeling, all of these are in the toolbox or into the, so most likely in this case in the toolbox, but there are so many other things that are happening. You could see the code exactly there and you could play around with the code in order to improve it. For example, this is one of the things that I did. So as a part of my master, I took the S. Loretta, which is this result, and I thought, uh, if you don't know how many sources you have, which you usually don't, then you don't know if this, this is what the S. Loretta is showing you at zero percent. You don't know if this is one source, two source with some noises, or this is four source or three source or so on. So I developed an algorithm with my supervisor, Dr. Susan Beishti, and uh, we called it HRS Loretta or the improved version right now, EHRS Loretta, which takes the Loretta as the input, denoises it and provides you the output so you don't see the lower representation. So anything that is not sourced in the brain will be completely zero. So you have a higher resolution Loretta or HRS Loretta. So that's pretty much it for today. Uh, I hope I haven't bored you for one hour and a half. If there is any questions or anything, I'll be more than happy to answer right now. Thank you so much, Yunus. That was amazing. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat, the Q&A. And if you have kind of a question you want to say out loud, I can turn on your mic for you if you guys would like. <laughs> 